Good morning, Southside. Special greeting. We're always glad for anyone who comes and joins us to worship our God together. We, we love having visitors. Uh, this is a most special Lord's Day as we're going to partake of the Lord's table together uh, at the close of our service. Uh, what a beautiful thing that God has left for his bride, uh, the Lord's table. So if you'll turn, we're going to continue in Philippians chapter 2. I just wanted to encourage the men for this uh, upcoming retreat. What could be better than men gathering around a fire, worshiping, studying the Word of God? Uh, if you can't sign up, you come talk to me because even I got through how to sign up, okay? So go to that little thing, follow it. It's easy to follow and get signed up and let's, let's go worship our God together up in the mountains. Philippians chapter 2. This morning we're going to finish up verses 1 through 18. Uh, I intended to do verses 14 through 18 in one sermon, but I, I just got stuck on verse 14 and knew that the Lord wanted us to stop and focus on that sin of grumbling and to put it to, get to death corporately together and individually and been hearing wonderful fruit of what God's doing in our hearts. So it's essential to our unity and our testimony and light to this dark and dying world, which is in chapter one, Paul's passion. Paul's passion is I want the gospel to spread, whether by life or by death. And all that we're studying feeds that ambition. And so let's be unified in this gospel and getting it to everyone we possibly can before we die or Jesus comes back. That is what unifies us. And that's what we've been taking up into where Jesus gave his church the last thing was a great commission to go and make disciples of all the nations. And so that is our mandate and that is our task from our king. So let's look at verses 14 through 18. I'll read them and we'll finish it up, Lord willing, this morning. Do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. But even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and I share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, Rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Let's go to the throne of grace. Father, I pray for the fruit of this passage in each and every heart. I pray that your spirit would take these words and illuminate them now to our minds. Let us have understanding of what you, Holy Spirit, intended when you uh, oversaw Paul as he wrote these words. You, you made these words inspired. God breathed as his human being worked them out as he wrote a letter so what we behold this morning is the very inerrant word of God, and I pray that our hearts would give heed to such a word. And I pray, Lord, that we would be these lights uh, in a dark and dying world, that we would be these kind of people. Lord, that the, the song that we just heard, that we would be humble men, women, and children before our God, and, and that the way up is the way down. God, I pray, teach us this. Teach us well that we might magnify you and put you on display in this world. God bless this time of worship through the word of God, we pray. Amen. Our outline is we're looking in this section that Paul has given us six encouragements where he said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And so we've saw first the pattern of the Christian life. How do we work this salvation out and Paul said, do it without grumbling and without disputing. We're to, to be a people who, as we work out this salvation, we're not running around always negative, bitter, uh, grumbling, complaining, but we're, we're a people who are content with our God and we are filled with Christ and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me in contentment. So there's the pattern of the Christian life. The pursuit of the Christian life that we studied is so that you will prove yourselves. That word was the present tense. This is what we're to be becoming, blameless, faultless, without reproach. We're to be innocent, something that was pure and unmixed with this world. It was undiluted wine, unalloyed metal, pure, sincere, not duplistic. And so we are to be becoming this. 
And then we looked at the pedigree of the Christian and we're to become children of God above reproach. We're to be growing as those who trust their Father, those who realize all things come from His hand. His mercies are new every morning. This is the only way to quit grumbling is to come from the heart of a child of God who loves and trusts His Father and everything that He brings into their life. And so we are a growing trusters of children of God, of their Father. So there's the pattern, the pursuit, the pedigree. And then the last thing we looked at was the place in which we are to do this. And we are to do this, Paul said, in the midst of a crooked world. That Greek word was scolios, scoliosis, a, a twisted, bent, crooked world that is perverse that carried the idea of a depraved mind. And so we are to enter into this dark, twisted, depraved world, and we're to, to be lights. We're, we're to shine. We're to be luminaries of, of the grace of God, and we are to show forth the mercies of our God by our lives. And so we are to be stars, luminaries. And verse 16, as we go forth into this world, he says to be holding fast the word of life holding it fast so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. And so I want to keep moving now in Paul's argument. Uh, he's not done. He's going to give us a, a nice little exclamation point of what we've been studying in our passage. So our fifth point will be the product of working out our salvation. And we have this uh, so that. It's, it's a connector. It's to explain. And so so that, this is the way we're to be lights by not grumbling and living different in this world, so that in the day of Christ, Paul lived with his eye always to that day. It, it seemed to be in his trials, his encouragement was the day of Christ. In every suffering, the day of Christ, affliction, like persecution, he always had that one eye looking to that day when Christ would come back, when he would come and establish his eternal kingdom. He, he looked for that second advent. He, he longed for it. He hastened its day. He knew that there would be an accounting one day of his stewardship of the gospel. Paul knew, I'll stand before this God and give an account for the stewardship that God gave me and said, go and make disciples of all men as an apostle. I'm going to have to give evidence one day uh, in a courtroom of what did I do with this gift that you gave to me, O oh God. In 1 Corinthians 3.10, Paul said, according to the grace of God, which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and this is in the church of God. And another is building upon that foundation. But let each man be careful how he builds upon it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which, is, which has been laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so watch what you build on, this foundation of Christ. If any man builds upon that foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it that day of Christ, because it's to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself is going to test the quality of each man's work. And if any man's work which he has built upon it remains, he shall receive a reward. And if any man's work and laboring in this gospel is burned up, he's going to suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Yet so as through fire. So he's going to be saved, but all of his work was in, in vain. And so there's two kinds of ways to build on this foundation. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 4.1, Let a man regard us in this manner as due losses of Jesus Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it's required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. But to me, it's a very small thing that I should be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even examine myself. For I'm conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God." 
So on this day, I want you to hear what's going on. Paul's telling the Philippians, this day of Christ, I want to glory in that day because I didn't run in vain or toil in vain with you, church in Philippi. When Paul says toil, that's what he meant. I've traveled all over 1,500 miles. I've been in danger, persecutions, famines, and shipwrecks, and beatings, and mockings. I, I've, I've run in such a way as to beat my body and give myself a black eye that I would win the prize and not be disqualified at the end. And so here he is pouring out his heart, and he's narrowing in on his service to Philippi. And he's saying to them, don't let this be in vain. That you do not enter into these things, the gospel, sanctification, unity, humility of mind, serving one another, and not grumbling in our immediate context. I want you to enter into these things and grow. I don't want you just to have a bunch of notebooks all marked up. I want you marked up. I want you to become this, Paul said. I want Philippians 2.2, make my joy complete by being of the same mind and maintaining the same love, united in spirit and intent on one purpose. Philippians, work out your salvation. Be blameless and innocent in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. I want you to be lights. Hold to this word and hold it out to the lost. Be humble, Christ-like servants washing feet, not fighting and disputing and grumbling. I want to present to Christ his bride in the likeness of him. I'm laboring that Christ might be formed in you. This is Christ's likeness. Have this mind in you, which was in Christ Jesus. I'm laboring that you would have the mind of Christ. Bless me by being like Christ, Philippi. That's what he's crying out. Just quit being hearers and not doers. I, I, I want to see you become like Jesus Christ and be humble and serving and taking this gospel out together. That's why I'm laboring in your lives. That's what I'm after. I want to present you to Christ. Bless me by being like Christ. Let the gospel have its way in you. I've been thinking a lot about this. There's some joys in getting old. You wake up sore, but you don't have all these little ones that you're chasing around. I, I, I think for 18 years, I didn't think. I, I just love you parents. I get to sit around and think now. And I personally derive no pleasure from just teaching through books. Four years in Romans, just studying and laboring and praying over it and asking God reveal it. Seeing connections grammatically and theologically, preaching it week in and week out through COVID, through fires and everything that took place. And I just, why? Why would you do this verse after verse, week after week? What do you want to see? That's big. Because you who are going into ministry, you can lose the forest for the trees. And it's pretty simple what Paul's saying. I want to see Christ formed in you. I don't want to die and this church be a bunch of gnarly people with no unity, sitting around fighting about doctrine, sharpening your axe, and hitting every Arminian that walks by. I don't want you to be self-seeking. And I don't want you to not give a rip about those who are perishing. I don't want to bring that to the day of Christ and it burn up. I want us to be luminaries. I hate that this world is so opposed to Christ. But I love that we shine brighter and brighter in the midst of it. And so I can't tell you what it means to me when someone tells me they love Christ more because of this body. And baptisms when people have repented and believed in Christ. So it doesn't do a lot for me if you can declare all five points of Calvinism by proof text and defend it, and you're not humble washing the saints' feet. If you've read all of Pink's books and you do not labor in the Word of God seeking to know Christ, it doesn't get me excited. This is what Paul shot at, this is what he wanted to see in his church. His goal was not 500 programs 
to keep everyone busy, but it was 500 stars shining in the darkness of this generation that many would come to Jesus Christ. This is it. And this is so good as I was just in my study this week. Just dads and moms, what do you want to see? I I know it's hard to slow down, but stop. What is your goal, dads and moms? What what do you want to do? You got to ask that question. And the answer's got to be this. I want them to know Christ and be conformed to his image and dwell with him forever. If that's not my chief end, um, you're shooting at the wrong thing. Real simple. That's the answer. That's the goal. Everyone who serves in this church, you got to ask a question. Why do I do it? Because that's what you're supposed to do. Someone might notice me. What, what is the reason that I'm going to lay my life out and serve this body? Every elder and every deacon, what's your reason? Why are you doing what you're doing? <laughs> what an answer Paul gives us this morning. Paul, Paul did not want to stand empty-handed before Christ. He wanted fruit. 1 Thessalonians 2.19, for who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you, Thessalonicus, in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? For you're our glory and our joy. You're not going to burn up. You're, you're the ones that we're going to boast over the power of God. Philippians 1.3, I thank my God and all my remembrance of you always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. Let me ask two, I think, probing questions. (laughs) Who will glory because of your life? Who will glory because of your life? Is there any minister, discipler, spouse, parent, teacher who's going to glory and the fruit of Christ being formed in you. Is there anyone? Maybe a better question. Whose life have I impacted that will cause me to glory on that last day? Have I impacted any life for Jesus Christ? And I tell you, this puts to shame the spectator sport of American Christianity. Thank you for your sermon. Goodbye. I'll see you next week. Our commission is to make disciples, to get involved in people's lives, and to impact them for Jesus Christ. And maybe we'll go deeper. Husbands, is the ministry to your wife going to cause you to glory on that last day? when she stands before God and she's been conformed to the image of Christ. That you gave your life to her and to see her washed in the word and to grow. Or do you care more about what's going on in the Broncos camp right now? Your job, your your iPad, just sit there staring at it. Ignore your wife, your kids. Parents, will you bring these children to glory with you? Will you glory on the last day because of these Christ-like luminaries? And I know that no parent can save a child. I'm just telling you what our goal is. Don't lose sight of the goals, Mom. The The day to day is so hard. Please don't lose sight of wanting Christ formed in those children. And children, this doesn't begin when you turn 18. You can already do this. Wouldn't you like to lead your little brother or sister to Christ? Those in your Sunday school, sports teams, your play, your dance team, your chess club. I loved our little baptism last week of the the sister that led her little brother to Christ. Whoever that was, I forgot, COVID, but I love you. Uh, Children, you can pour in to others. You can pour into your little Sunday school friends and you you have an opportunity to do the same thing as the adults. And for singles, 
please don't forget who's writing these words this morning. This is the greatest time to pour in to people. You have more time than you'll ever have as a single man or woman. And the number one time of your life right now is, it's the number one time to squander your life. So you, you've never had a greater opportunity as a single person to, to see Christ formed in others. And it's the time where I watch most people squander it on things that won't last. That was for free. I'm not so worried about exposition, but about our souls. Don't come to your deathbed and look back on the questions that I just asked you. Don't get caught up in the rat race. And as John Piper said, don't waste your life. Look to the day of Christ today. Who would glory because of my service and ministry to them? And who will I glory because of their influence in my life? So this morning, I want you to repent of sideline grumbling Christianity if that's your life. Because it's wood, hay, straw, and stubble, and it will burn up on that last day. Okay, good stuff. Paul's going to bless us further. He's given us a little glimpse into his heart. He laid it all out. And now he's going to show us how this Christ-like attitude is to be worked out by practical examples. Everything we've been learning, Paul, give me some examples. I like people I can follow. And it's amazing what's going on in this passage between Paul Timothy and Epaphroditus and the whole Philippian church. It's just everything we've been learning about humility and serving one another. And you're going to see that they're working for a common goal with strong love and selfless, humble service with no hint of grumbling or disputing. Everything that's coming into their lives, sitting in prison, they're praising God. Uh, uh, Epaphroditus almost dies, they're praising God. It, hard things are going on and there's not a word of grumbling in this passage. You got stuff... Uh, I already said it. Three guys are just luminaries in the midst of it all. They're examples of their humble hearts and their self-forgetfulness. And so we want to be like them. Let us become sons and daughters like these ones that we're going to look at for the next few weeks. So in verses 17 through 18, our, our last point in this section now is I want you to see the purpose of Paul. Our, our last P, the purpose of Paul. And look with me in verse 17. But... Even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. And so Paul now is going to bring in this imagery of sacrifice. And it immediately conjured up an image in the Philippians' mind that, that they probably had that we don't. And they instantly think altar, blood, sacrifice, lib libation. They knew this in their daily life. And so the picture of the sacrifice offering, Paul's going to pull out here. And he, he begins by saying, I'm a drink offering. So what would happen is that the animal was killed and burned. And as the sacrifice, the offer now takes wine and would pour it on top of that sacrifice. 2 Kings 16.13, Jeremiah 7.18, and Hosea 9.4 give a description of it. Paul only used this word, though. It's interesting, the drink offering in one other place. I'd like to read it to you from 2 Timothy 4, 6. Paul said at the end of his life, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. So I've been poured out as a drink offering, and my departure is here, and his departure is going to be his head being cut off in Rome. And so Paul's looking at this animal that's burned, and he's thinking about the drink offering as the final sacrificial act. And Paul's kind of saying, my life is a libation upon another's sacrifice. All of you Philippians, it's a first-class condition again, which means since, in, in verse 17, since I'm being poured out as a drink offering, and it's in the present tense, so I'm being poured out. That's why I don't think it's just martyrdom in his mind. I think it's his, his life. He's looking at all that he's done to serve the church and his coming martyrdom as a part of it. <clears throat> so I'm being poured out as an offering. 
My life is a drink offering. I'm chained to a Roman soldier pouring out my life for your faith. You remember Philippians 1.25, he's saying, I don't know if I want to live or die. I know I want to die. It's very much better. But for your sake, I need to remain on in the flesh, convinced of this. I know that I will remain and continue with you all for what? For your progress and joy in the faith. And so I am laying my life out for your faith to keep growing and being strengthened. That's what I'm giving my life for. I'm just this topping off one on the sacrifice. Um, I'm just the libation on top of it, the humility of Paul, even in that statement. But Paul could be saying, why am I chained? Why are the Philippians, why am I not free to preach? What, you know, he could have just been grumbling. You're not going to see that. Paul just said, I'm being poured out upon the sacrifice and service of, of your faith. And so guys, girls, here's where we're to aim. This is the goal of our fellowship in our church, is to grow each other's faith. We have all these means, and we come together and we use them to grow our faith. And what I want you to get from this is Paul says, in this, I rejoice and I share my joy with you all. I'm being poured out as an offering. The highest expression of Paul's life was to give his life as a sacrifice for the church. And so I look at Paul, and you know what he, you know what he doesn't have? A bucket list, vacations, family. He didn't have family, no house. He just has this one thing, one thing I do. Doesn't that sound like a horrible life? All this guy is is being beaten to a pulp everywhere he goes. He, sometimes he's hungry, he's thirsty, he's just ridiculed. Every work he begins, the Jews would come in and sow legalism. Like, real fun life. Think of our missionaries in North Africa and Mexico, Spain. What kind of life is that? Paul says, I view my life as a sacrifice to God. He really did say, by the mercies of God, I offer up my body a living sacrifice. Here it is, God. And Paul's greatest joy came at the greatest level of sacrifice to Jesus Christ. You, you, you picture a somber, morose man, but instead you have this man laying out his life, being a poured out drink offering, and he says, this is my joy. He says, if I live, I'm the Lord's. If I die, I'm the Lord's. For me to live is Christ. My greatest goal and joy is to be a sacrifice to God. That's what it means to be born again. Here's my life, Lord. Here's my heart. And it's countercultural to our day completely. And this has just gone from the church today. And when we became seeker-sensitive in the 70s and 80s, the whole thing flipped. And the mindset today is, how does the church meet my needs? How can you meet my felt needs? I walk into a church saying, what can you do to meet my needs? And I have a little list to see if you can meet all of my needs. Does that fit? With, do you think Paul would have laughed at that or taken that list and burned it or spit at it? That's not the place where I lose my life for the good of my brothers and sisters in Christ. And in verse 18, you too, Philippi, south side, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Let's find joy and, and together and, and in the Lord as we lay our lives out for one another. And all of our persecution and laboring for each other's faith and the things that are coming against it. He just says, rejoice. Rejoice that our lives are on the altar. Rejoice that you're, you're laying it down, saying, here it is, God. Here's my life for you, for the good of others in service. The world, the church, they are seeking for joy desperately, and they can't find it. It's, it's elusive. No matter how many times the pastors preach on how to have joy and peace, they can't find it. And let's just face it, we are looking for joy in our circumstances. I, I walked in this morning, and I can't remember who it was. Good morning. How you doing? I'm doing good because God's good. 
My circumstances don't matter. He does. <laughs> I love it. Paul had none. Paul had no circumstances when he wrote this, but he had joy. There is a way to find joy in whatever God brings and puts us in as we're laying our lives out. And I've quoted this thing maybe 10 times, but I felt led to do it again this morning. So if you're visiting, you're going to go like, that was a great illustration. If you've been here 20 years, you're like, again? <laughs> so you tell me which. There is a bridge in San Diego that crosses to the island of Coronado with million-dollar homes. And there's a bridge in Brooklyn that leads out to a poor, depressed slum. And more people kill themselves off the San Diego Bridge than the Brooklyn Bridge. You're not going to find this joy in this world and possessions and material. You're not going to find it. You're not going to find your joy in the world and things and circumstances. I pray you would hear that. It's a vacuum in your soul. And we're using God to try to get more of those things. Advertisers are so good, but they never tell you the emptiness afterwards when you tried to find life in that product. It's Christ. And Paul's restless soul found his rest in Christ. And now joy was in knowing him and serving him out of love and delight. Few know this joy. For Paul, his service to other people was born out of the sacrifice of the one that he loved. Paul found his joy in being a libation for the faith of the Philippians so that they would shine as lights and that God would be glorified. That's why martyrs sing at the stake. My life is just a libation to be poured out for Christ over the lives of others. And if I had a thousand lives to live, I would spend them all for Christ. And if I had a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, and if I had a thousand deaths, I would die them all for Christ. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Do you view your life as a sacrifice? What have you said no to that you could say yes to the bride of Christ? You want some help with your sleep? I found something better than melatonin, though I still like melatonin. <laughs> Go tell someone about Jesus. Go tell them. Stand up and declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sacrificially give your money and don't hoard it and spend it on yourself only. Go serve your wife. Give yourself to the people of this body to grow their faith. Just by prayer for them through this directory, whatever. Love. You were made to love, not watch TV every night. Invest in people. And where do we learn this? We learn it in the school of Christ. Hebrews 12, 2, he was fixing his eyes we're, we're to run, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He is the perfect illustration of ultimate sacrifice with ultimate joy in, in such a death. And I pray you see the key that the humility of Christ, if you want humility, have this mind which was in Christ Jesus. If you want unity, it's in Christ. And it says if there's any encouragement in Christ, that's our unity. And if you want to quit grumbling, it's because you have everything in Christ. You have everything. You can't grumble. If you want to be a light, it's the light that came into the world and the radiance of God's glory that we put on display. A joyful sacrifice to God. All power is from him. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And I can uh, work out my salvation with fear and trembling because he's at work in me both to will and to do his good pleasure. So let me summarize and just make this clear and we'll close out. And we'll go to the table. Our call is to humility, not self-glory. And this is what it means to be born again, to shift from self-glory to God's glory, to serve other people, to have the example of Christ who didn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. This is exactly what Paul is doing 
his life laid down and spilled out for the Philippians that their faith would grow into Christ-likeness. He was martyred for the good of their faith. This is joy. This is the freedom of the sons of God. I'm asking you to come be the most happiest, joyful people on the face of the earth. Die to yourself and go wash the saints' feet and serve them. Jesus said, save your life, which is the American way, and you're going to lose it. Lose your life, and you'll gain it. In verse 18, Paul says, go do the same. Go find the joy of losing your life for others. Sit in a chair and spend every day thinking about yourself and all what everyone's not doing and what God's not doing. Just sit there and all you'll do is grumble. And this is the the call to have the mind of Christ and to see all that he's given you in Christ and to go out and, and it's no longer looking at me, it's looking at Christ and I'm ready to go lay it out for others. The strength that this brings in your service is unbelievable. I really believe that a thousand problems that we're carrying, not all of them, some of the stresses and disappointments and hurts could be healed by getting over yourself and being poured out as a drink offering on the faith for other people. May Southside be a gathering of these kind of people, united on one thing, lifting up the name of Jesus Christ by word and deed until we see Jesus. I pray that we'd be a spiritual Milky Way lighting up this world, shining for the lost to see their way to Jesus. And so I close. We're going to go to the table. But I just, if you're here, I just want you to, to hear and understand what can change this self-focus living in this bondage to yourself. And there's only one power that can break it. And that's that God sent forth his son into this world and he took on humanity and he was born into a manger and he entered this world under the law and he came and he perfectly fulfilled God's demands. He came and he, he modeled a perfect righteousness as perfect humanity. And the gospel is, is that he did that in our place. And then the sins that we committed should be punished by God. They have to be punished. If you hope that you can die and maybe your good deeds outweigh your bad, I can, I can save you a lot of time. They can't. One sin, you're guilty of breaking the whole law. Adam's sin is already put to your account. You have no hope on your own. And so Jesus Christ was put up on a cross and God put your sins upon him and he took the sword of justice and he poured out for three hours on his own son uh, on that cross while he bore the wrath of God and drained it for your sins so that you could sit here this morning and have every sin forgiven by God, past, present, and future. Forgiveness of sins, what you can't find. You can have a psychiatrist tell you forever you're not guilty, and you sit there going, I'm guilty. And what I'm telling you today is you can have that guilt washed away and cleansed from your conscience because of the blood of Jesus that was shed in your place. Your sins can be forgiven and separated as far as the east is from the west. And God will take the life of Jesus and by faith, He'll put it to your account so that you sit here this morning perfectly righteous before your God. So this, if you try to attain this righteousness your whole life, you'll never get there. You'll just go backwards. And God's saying, I'll give you my righteousness. My son came and gave me the righteousness I wanted. I raised him from the dead and I said, it was enough. And I'll give that to you by grace through faith. If you'll come with an empty hand, not cleaning yourself up, not being good enough, come saying, my only hope is Jesus Christ and I believe in him. God says, I will give that to you this morning and you could stand before God justified, which means the God of the universe saying, you're not guilty. Your sins are forgiven. Your righteousness now, it measures up to what God requires because of Jesus. And so you could just sit here, joined to your God and adopted into his family as a daughter or son. That's what God is offering to you this morning. And so I pray if you've never come to Jesus Christ, Jesus himself on earth said, come to me. 
Are you weary and heavy laden with your sin and trying to clean up? Come and I will give you rest for your souls. Today you could be forgiven and made right with God. All that burden that you're carrying could fall off at the cross. Come to Jesus. He says, I'll cast out no one. Don't say I'm too bad, I'm not good. Come as a sinner and receive everything from Jesus Christ. He offers to that to you this morning. We're gonna go to the table and we're gonna remember this death now of Jesus Christ for us. And so let me pray. Father, we come before you and I thank you now that we get to come to the table. I thank you that we get to remember this death of the Son of God in our place. God, let us remember joyfully together. Let our joy be made full. Let this be the fuel to our sacrifice, this great sacrifice of Jesus Christ. May it fuel us for eternity to serve others, to have the mindset that you had, Jesus, and lay it out, to spend and be spent, to be drink offerings on the sacrifice of others that they could hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. God, I pray that you would do that in our midst. I pray now, bless this time together. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.